I came out of nice George Decay. I said, good evening, everyone. I'm George Decay. <laughs> right now, I'd like to introduce my co-actor, co-worker, Bo <laughs> Shatner, singing his rendition of everybody's kung fu fight. So I got up and I got everybody's kung fu fight. And then, and then I was like looking over, like waiting for him to come out and go, you know, but he never did, so, anyway. All right, keep smiling, smiling, keep smiling. Yeah, for those of you who have never seen me before, you're like, who is on stage right now? That ain't Ninja Kim. Okay. Oh, relatives. Okay. <laughs> My mom calls me like, we're in traffic right now. I don't think we're going to make it. Okay, but your uncle will be there. Where is my uncle? Oh, he's a sick. Why are you sitting aside to that side? There's not enough room, huh? Okay. All right, so we're just going to go down. Um, first, my mom and dad are here. Mom and dad, stand up, please. All the way from Kitchener. AKA Berkeley. Jordan's in the house. Okay. Then, uh, 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 now, how, how do I call these? Uh, my aunt, my yeah, great aunt, grand aunts. Okay, everyone, grand, great grand aunts and aunts. Everyone, clap for them, please. <laughs> yeah. My cousin Timmy, right here. Timmy, please stand up, right here. My uncle George, right here, and my great uncle, I guess I can say, right here. Uncle George lives in Mississauga. He has like a photo developing store. Where's it at? Where's it at? Is it, is it used to be or is it now? It used to be in Richmond Hill. Where, where is it now? No more. Oh, okay. No. Oh, all right. Well, he had a photo developing shop. Someone came up to me in the autograph line and said, Hey, we've been in your uncle's store. Your photo's over in the store. He's proud of you. I'm like, yeah, he probably is, I guess. <laughs> right. Anybody else? Anybody else? No? Mom, is that it? Okay. <laughs> Check with mom, because she knows everything. Everyone can deal with that, right? All my life. She knows everything. Uh, oh, photos, that's right. Okay, this side here. Um, this side always gets the action pose, right. This is how you can pose my action figure. Right? <laughs> Super cute. I cannot balance much longer, hurry. <laughs> I'm not joking, hurry. <laughs> oh! Okay, all right, so very quickly, just so you get your cameras ready, because I am coming down. Okay, I'm gonna come on this side, then I'm coming in the middle, then I come right there, there you go. You guys already had yours, come on. Right. I started doing this because I was in Oklahoma City and the crowd was so large and I was doing my standard left, center, side, and I realized that people in the back were, you know, were getting pictures of me, which I, I look like an ant on stage, so I said, I'm gonna, wah, say that again. <laughs> this whole time I'm walking up and the little, little baby's like, wah, wah, wah. I walk up, it's like, mm, quiet. <laughs> Got it? Okay, that's good. I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be so blind after this. All these flashes. Good. Got that? Yeah. See spots. Ready? There we go. Yes. 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 There you go. Okay. See, when I run for president of the world, I get all your votes. Yes. Okay. That. Okay. Are you taking a picture of my backside now? Is that what you're doing? Okay. Are you attempting to? Yeah. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, I'm sure there's one there. Oh. Yeah. yeah, you gotta be careful. If you're in any kind of uncompromising position, the fans will take advantage immediately. <laughs> Let's say I was yes. actually on a Star Trek cruise convention years ago. Oh, no. John Delancey was on the same convention, and uh, we were cruising the Caribbean, so we got this opportunity to, you know, all the people on the, on the cruise conventions were allowed to go on this excursion on an island to go snorkeling. So we're all snorkeling. And uh, they, after you snorkel, there's like a little area of outdoor showers. So you just rinse off the salt water. So, and there's a little wall there. So there's a wall about <coughs> even high in the shower. So the Lancy's over there showering, you know. And it looks like from a distance that 
he's butt naked because you know the wall you don't see a swim trunks. So I'm laying out on a on the beach and I look over and around me there's like five or six different fans that are kind of slowly reaching down to pick up cameras with telephoto lenses. <laughs> so you know, there's pictures of the lens like, <laughs> you know, like in all these different poses of him watching himself, which are now in many, many um, photo albums and uh, possibly online. Kind of <laughs> you got it? Thanks for being here. Oh, thank you. Oh, Scotty. <laughs> Who said Ni Hao? Oh, okay. Ni <laughs> Hao. Yes, it is you. Ni <laughs> Hao in Chinese is how are you? So, okay. Good, good. Got you guys, right? Yes, yes, yes. Yes. <coughs> sure, we'll take another one. Would you come with her? Very much. But don't play into the stereotype. Don't get up next time. <laughs> All right. Good, good. Oh, yes. process so they can the camera crew gets to see how we're going to be walking this and the lighting crew gets to see what they need to do to light the scene so we're walking along and the director says cut go back to one during the rehearsal go back to one means go back to the first position start the rehearsal again so we can look at it again well when he said cut go back to one I turned around to go walk back and I reached back to grab Jerry Ryan's elbow to, like, to, to lead her back like come on honey let's go and I reached back, and instead of her elbow, I grabbed a hold of her left breast. <laughs> For one hundred dollars, you may touch this hand. So. <laughs> the hand was on the... <laughs> I know, auction item. <laughs> 
Joy's even, Joy's even it out. Joy's at 75 dollars. Touch the hand, touch your arms, rest. Joy's here. Joy's here. Come on in. 50 dollars. Come on. Joy's at 50 dollars. Oh, 50 dollars. Sold in the back of the room. Come on up and touch the hand and touch the breast. Um, hands on the breast. And immediately I realized this is not her elbow. <laughs> immediately she realized it too. She, Jerry was like, mm hmm? Mm hmm? And I said, I will. I was, I'm sorry. I said, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I thought that was your elbow. And she was like, mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Everybody in the crew was laughing. They were on the floor laughing. I was so embarrassed. I was just, I, was, I can't believe how embarrassed I was. And I, I was just, I, like I just slithered off the set. Like, <laughs> um, 25 minutes later, we were called back on the set to film the scene. Uh -huh. And, uh, <laughs> Uh, I got on the set first, so I was over there waiting around, you know. Then all of a sudden I hear Jerry, you know, Jerry's kind of talking, laughing, and she comes on the set, and I can hear laughter. And I'm like, what are people laughing at? Laughter gets louder, louder, and she comes around the corner. I notice, she looks straight at me with this little kind of cat ate the canary look, and, kind of, and I notice that she has two post-it notes, one right here on her shoulder, pointing down to her elbow with the words elbow written on it. Another post-it note above her breast pointing down with an arrow to her breast saying not an elbow. And she walks up to me and says, you know, just for you, you know, just if you didn't know, just a little visual aid for you to realize what is an elbow and what is an elbow. That is the elbow story. Thank you. Thanks. Two Harrys, what? Remember, um, the, the original Oh, yeah, what was the story I was going to tell you? Oh, yeah, this, this lady was in the autograph line. She was, she was mentioning that during that one episode um, where the, uh, what was the alien race that had all the different Bidians. parts? Bidians. Bidians. What was the name of the episode where they came in for harvesting us and Harry Kim, number one, falls out through the air, air hatch? Does anyone remember that? Oh, shoot. Well, what's the name of it? Deadlock, ooh, Deadlock. get the prize, you're good. Deadlock, okay, so during Deadlock, Harry Kim 1 is gone. Harry Kim 2, the duplicate, is the one who's still alive through the rest of the series. Um, but what was funny was uh, just how the rest of the crew dealt with that. I mean, do you remember that? Like, Kim like, falls out the air, he's like, ah, and Blanca is like, Harry! And then all of a sudden, you know, Janeway calls to, to Blana, you know, Blana, what's going on? Harry's dead or he's gone. And Jimmy goes, okay, all right, what else is going on? You know, I mean, there was like no, there was no care or concern. There, and it was just, and this just goes to show you, I mean, all throughout the series, it's Harry that gets, he's the first one that dies. Harry's always getting abused. And when he dies, no one cared. And it was just like, who cares? 10 minutes after that, after she, Janeway is like brushing it off, she walks over to Tuvok and says, Mr. Tuvok, give me a status report. And Tuvok looks over and he's like, he's like, well, we have uh, five crewmen who are injured. We have this deck six is imploded. Da -da 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 -da. He goes through the whole thing. Da -da 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 -da. And not once he goes, and so Jim is dead. He doesn't even say that. <laughs> well, I'm not even on the sheet any longer. It's like, uh, oh well, so it's okay. We'll use that other Asian extra walking in the back to replace you. No problem. Because I'm Tuvok. If you, call, if you call Tim Russ's, well, you're not going to call it because you don't know his number, but when I call Tim Russ's answering machine, his phone, his answering machine goes off, it's, it, he sounds just like Tuba. Hello, you've reached Tim Russ. Please leave a message. I mean, there's no difference between Tuvok and Tim Russ. He is Tuvok to the point where sometimes I forget his real name. I'm like, hey, Tuvok, what's up? How are you? Uh, the show's been done for two years. My name is Tim Russ. Tuvok. Okay. Um, any questions? Any questions? Any questions? There's a little mic there? Okay. That's all right. We don't have to have questions. I'll just keep going. Um, yeah, when I first got on the show, that was, uh, that was an amazing time. It really was. Um, we were talking about... Uh, I booked like three or four different projects at the same time. I, I booked a role on Mortal Kombat. I booked a role in a movie, I booked Star Trek. I had to turn down everything to do Star Trek because of uh, uh, the whole fiasco with Jean-Pierre Pujol uh, being the captain for a day and a half. And uh, when she left, you know, the whole, the whole operation shut down. They had to look for another captain. So they looked long and hard and wide. And the rumor was 
they were going to cast a male captain. He said, if we can't find a female captain, we're going to have to get, have a male captain. The next rumor was, if they cast a male captain, one of the other char characters who's already cast has to be changed to female. So that means somebody's going to lose their job, you know, at which point I was like, I can do Tootsie. I can do Tootsie. Mm -hmm. Hello, Harrietta Kim, how are you? Do you like my wig? <laughs> anyway, um, but that didn't happen, thank goodness. So, yes, question. Mike? Mike? Can we turn on the mic, the question mic? Mr. Technical People? Um, Guys? Hi. hi. Good. Um, Thanks. How did you get the name... Gooby or Goober. Or... How did I get the name Gooby or Goober? You know what? That's just a ter term of affection. For, yeah, it is. It's, it's not a really nice sounding name. And the reason, the, the true, I don't know what, what the, whatever. It's just kind of a dorky name, yes. But uh, that is what Jerry Ryan calls her son, Goober, Gooby. And she called me Goober or Gooby. People that she feels close to, she calls Goober. Gooby. Guys, not girls, you know. Um, <laughs> And I remember one day, uh, she called Robert Beltran, you know, Goober. And I was so offended, I was like, oh, he's not Goober, I'm Goober! Oh. I was so upset, I was like, and she's like, oh, okay, you can be Goober number one, Robert's Goober number two. And I was like, that's better, and Walls I'm number one, that's fine. So, felt a lot better about that. Yes, next question. Um, this isn't a question, but I know that your favorite episode is Timeless, and I have a card here for you. Oh, you do have the top. Oh, is that you're gonna? Yeah, it's real. Oh, thank you. Come on up. Look at that. She has a card, trading card for me from. Oh, thank you. Here, can I have a? Oh. That's all. Thanks. And it's in plastic too. <laughs> and her phone number. Hey. <laughs> Just kidding. Okay. She's like, I'm twelve. <laughs> The hardest episode to film. The hardest episode to film. Yeah. Uh, the shoot. <laughs> that wasn't supposed to be funny, but that was... <laughs> He's like, <laughs> the shoot. If you remember the shoot, that's the prison episode yeah. with Kim and Paris in prison, um, season three. And the reason why that was the most difficult episode to shoot to film, <laughs> the shoot was the most difficult episode to shoot. Okay. Uh, was because that episode took place in that prison the whole time, which was very, they used a lot of, uh, they brought in a lot of, like, dirt and, and, and all kinds of things which were, I think, carcinogenic, actually. And we were inhaling, you know, all kinds of particles. Um, so that by the end of the episode, it was a seven day, all our shoots take about seven days, all the episodes take about seven days to film. And at the end of the seven days, I think 60% of the crew had some, version or form of bronchitis, you know, more than half. Um, all the, ca I did myself, I, I got bronchitis, uh, all the other people working on that were just dying. Um, and beyond that, I, there was also a lot of just physical injuries too during that show. So that was the most difficult, I have to say. Yes? I was asked to ask you about the kissing the cow episode. <laughs> the kissing owl? The cow. Oh, cow. Oh, it's, oh. Spirit folk. Yes, Fairhaven. The, the Irish. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, speaking of which, actually, that, during that episode, I had done the entire scene, I prepared the entire scene with an Irish accent, but they didn't let me do it, so. Oh, no. Bastards! Okay. I don't know the scene, I can't do it. Yeah. <laughs> So the, uh, the cow, kissing the cow, I was, um, why did I kiss the cow? I, well, I kissed the girl who became the cow, right? Yes. Um, what's your question about that, though? I don't know, I was just asking last kiss. You just want to get on that mic, didn't you? You just want to get attention. Who said that? Who told you to uh, go ask that? Point the person out. Did you ask her that? Oh, okay, all right. Um, next. Why'd Harry Kim turn down 7 of 9? Say it again? Oh. Why'd Harry Kim turn down 7 of 9? Why did Harry Kim turn down 7 of 9? I don't remember that. Good question, young man. <laughs> Let's just turn back the pages of our memory and go back to that episode, right? 
There we are. I'm re well, let's go back even further. When I was first reading the script for it, okay, Kim, in an effort to leer seven of nine, asked her to come to the mess hall. Mmm. After hours? Mmm. No one else is there. Mmm. <laughs> Reading along, Kim is talking to, to Seven of Nine, making small talk. Seven of Nine says this lighting is insufficient. You, da, 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 da. you don't really, you've brought me here on false pretenses. Kim gets nervous, does the back pedal. I'm reading along, and then she says, Ensign Kim, do you wish to copulate? <laughs> As an actor reading this, I was like, Whoo! I did a jig when I read this. I was like, yeah, look at this. I am an Irish leprechaun now. Okay, so that was an exciting time when I read that. Then I read the next line. Kim answers, no. No, yes, fool, exactly. I flipped through the rest of that script, but where's the rest of it? Come on now, come on, don't fail me. Um, that was very difficult to film that scene. <laughs> very upsetting. Very, I was so distraught. I, I, I should have, I should have uh, sought psychiatric help after that. But uh, I remember filming that. We, we did that scene, and I, you know, she said, "Do you wish to copulate?" And I go, "No." Uh, and after they said cut, you know, Jerry Ryan looks at me. and She's like, "You lost out." <laughs> She turns around and looks at the crew. Any takers? And they're like, oh, 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 Call me Mr. Copulate, I'm right here. Pick me, pick me, pick me. After that episode aired, I don't care where I, I, I could have been in every city that I was in, just going through the airport, you know, it doesn't matter. I, I could be at, a, at the gas station putting gas in. People were just coming up to me going, oh. <laughs> to the hand, I mean, it was just that people were absolutely just, you know, distraught for me, going, you, you, same thing, subtext, you lost out, buddy, you know, so that was a very, very difficult time, thank you for bringing up such sore, sore things that, that I, yes, thank you so much, next, continuing with that open wound, yes, continuing with that open wound, what do you have for me, young man, no, no more, no one under 18 is to ask another question, that's the problem, here. the kids always kill you, yes, did you ever get tired of filming Constantly, those romances that failed, the hologram, the xenophobic person that made you glow. <laughs> what are you, a writer? Keep going. All right. Let's keep going. The Is wrong twin. <laughs> yes, the wrong twins. Yes, you're right. Well, did I get sick of filming those? Yes, I did. You're right. Kim has gone through everything. No matter if he wasn't being beaten or tortured, he was torturing himself, going for the you know a holographic character, the dead girl. Remember the dead girl? What's up with that? Come on, Kim. The dead girl. That's good. Um, but it's it's. Uh, it's funny, I mean, a, a friend of mine was like, yeah, they should film an episode where, you know, Paris comes up to your door and he opens up the door and all he sees like a pair of like purple feet and your feet on the bed at the end, you know? <laughs> Just to show that you actually got something. But, uh... <laughs> Next. Yeah, still a little, exactly. Hi, um, Hi, I was just wondering, as an Asian American actor, is it difficult for you to get roles? Is it difficult for me to get roles? Yeah, like, I think it's- Like, aren't there typical? Yeah, there's a lot of very stereotypical roles out there. I was very lucky in being able to play for a length of time that I did. Um, it seems uh, that a lot of roles in Hollywood for Asian, Asian actors tend to have to be involved with martial arts somehow, or, you know, some schlocky accent, you know, Oh, I brought you a wonton soup, Mr. Smith! You know, whatever. So, it's just things like that, which are, you know, that's great. There are people who talk like this, but also uh, people that talk like this, you know? And then there's people who are Asian who talk like this, too, in the South, you know? Um, huh? Clyde, yes, Clyde Kasatsu. John Wayne accent. In his John Wayne accent, exactly. Very good, very good example, sir. Um, and so it is difficult. I think Hollywood is very slow to change. Um, Hollywood is also becoming more global. They're being more dependent, dependent upon revenue from um, box office sales from other countries. So I think as, as uh, China comes into its own and, and uh, with its massive population, maybe then you know, things will change a little bit more 
And um, it'd be nice to see Jackie Chan, you know, maybe do a role where he doesn't do one kick, you know, and see what happens with that, right? I mean, he's a good comedic actor. He could, he could pull it off. Um, so yeah, it is a little bit difficult, but uh, that's one of the reasons why I'm in this business, to try to make that change. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Oh, thank you for the two claps over there. I appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Young man. What was it like working on the set of Voyager? What was it like working on the set of Voyager? Um, it was... Uh, <coughs> It was like eating Brussels sprouts. No, it was like it was, it was, I thought it was better than that. No, it was uh, it was it was fun. It was t tiring sometimes. We were there a long time. My longest day on the set was 22 hours. 22 hours. And I was during the pilot, filming Caretaker. After that, 22 hours was done. They were like, "Thank you, good work." And at 22 hours, you're delirious. You're like, "Eh." And said, "Thank you, good work. We need you back here in five hours from now." So it was. I said, well, "Why don't I just sleep right where where we're standing?" You know. Um, but yeah, it was fun for the most part. But you know, the hours could be long. Thank you for your questions, young man. Um, yes. Hi. I just uh, wanted to ask what the auditioning process was like for the role, and like, what what do you think you did to stand up to get to get the role? Um, I bribed them. I mean, there was a lot of money involved. No. Uh, the auditioning process was difficult for me because I didn't have any major credits. So they were they kept having to bring me back. I had uh, I think six six auditions, maybe seven, six auditions, yeah. And typically, just to give you something to compare it to, Roxanne Dawson, Tim Russ, those guys were cast within two auditions, that's it. So I, ha I kept having to come back and come back, and, and the fifth audition, they had me up against some kid from New York. It was me and some Asian kid from New York, and the two of us were there, and, and uh, after we were done, I asked the casting director, I go, what's going on? They go, oh, they're sending the, the New York kid back to New York. I go, did I get the job? They're like, no, no, no. Now, but you're still in the running, they still like you, but now they want to see, they want to audition um, for another two weeks to look for older Ensign Kims, like 30-year-old Ensign Kims, and then bring that guy against you. So I said, all right. And my, uh, my talent agent said, don't do this, just tell them to, you know, go where the sun doesn't shine. And I said, I said well, I'll just, I'll hold on. And um, it just, they brought one guy, the sixth audition was against that other guy, the older guy, and, um, I think uh, uh, he ended up looking not really close to what they wanted, but he was a good actor, so they just kind of threw, threw it at me. But usually TV shows, they try to cast people who already have a lot of experience because it's a lot of money involved in terms of the production, and they don't want to have people that are novices. But it was, um, it was a long, long, drawn-out process to get that role, uh, but finally got it, which is a good thing. <laughs> um, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Like, it was very funny. After getting the role, there was a, there was a lot of you know crazy things that happened. And first of all, Jean Pierre Bujol being there, I mean her her rendition of of Janeway was really interesting. I mean it was like uh, that one scene, the caretaker in the beginning. Janeway comes in, she walks onto the bridge, and she uh, she uh, says she comes over to Kim Station. And she's like, uh, uh, is everything ready? And I said uh, something like yes, ma'am. And or, or and she says. Uh, uh, it's, it's not crunch time yet, Mr. Kim, you know, uh, call me a captain or something like that. And she comes down here, says hello to the first officer, sits down in the chair, and says, engage. Well, the way she did it, she came over, said something to me, walked over to the chair, sat down, closed her eyes, and she went, engage. <laughs> she went like, engage. Everybody was like, uh-oh. I mean, the camera crew, the actors are like, that's not very captainly. That's kind of like, you know, independent film Star Trek, you know, or, or just like artsy, artsy film Star Trek delivery. Engage. What is that? So, she quit the next day. Kate Mulgrew gets hired. She comes out to do the same scene, and everybody's nervous at this point. She's filming the same scene, they're like, what is she gonna do, you know? She comes through, she's like, all right, everything good? Okay, it's not crunch time yet, Mr. Kim. And she walks over here, just kind of real butch and stuff, and she's like, engage. <laughs> People are like, oh, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. So she became captain. 
After we filmed the pilot of Voyager, we got a letter. A letter and a videotape from the director of the next episode, Kim Friedman. She sent a letter. All of us were kind of on vacation, mini vacation, and reading this letter. Dear crew, uh, dear cast of Voyager, my name is Kim Friedman. I am the director of the second episode after the pilot episode, Caretaker. I have directed several Deep Space Nines, and I would like to tell you that none of you know how to shake. <laughs> S-H-A-K-E, shake. None of you know how to shake properly, okay? Now, enclosed in this package is a videotape of various Voyager actors shaking incorrectly. <laughs> Later in this footage, there's various uh, footage from various Deep Space Nine actors shaking correctly. <laughs> Feel free to practice this at home before <laughs> beginning. Uh, I'm serious. I'm not joking. Feel free to practice this at home. The key when shaking is to shake from the center and let the extremities follow. Do not bend over and shake. This is incorrect form. Uh, if uh, still after practicing at home, you have further problems. Feel free to contact any of the Deep Space Nine actors for a demonstration. <laughs> so when you, you know, whenever the, the ship gets hit, you know, they're like, shake! You know, you've got to have the right shake, not like, ugh, ugh. You know, that's not good. You have to shake from the center, right? Shake. So I just thought that last part was just hilarious, you know. You, I'm like, I still don't get it, so I'm walking down over to Deep Space Nine set, knock on Avery Brooks' trailer. <laughs> yes. <laughs> hey, Avery! Can you show me how to shake? <laughs> yeah, I'll shake your butt right out of here. Boom! You know? <laughs> he would have drop kicked me. So, I mean, that was just the most bizarre, bizarre letter ever. But we all learned, and we became expert shakers, and all the guest stars that came on, we had to teach them how to shake, because they don't know either. You know? Yes, question you have to do for your job. Yes. <laughs> Harry Kim, I believe, played the clarinet. Yes. Did you play it, or was it dubbed? Uh, it, was du it was actually dubbed. There was somebody else that played the soundtrack, but I had a clarinet teacher that came in every time I had to play clarinet for, we worked for maybe 10 to 20, 30 hours, literally, uh, because I, I was a stickler about, I wanted to make sure that when the song was playing, the playback, um, they were filming it, I wanted to make sure that I was playing all the correct notes with my fingers because I, I think that, you know, that's true to the role I and mean, you should try to make it look real at least. I, I hate it when you watch somebody, supposedly an actor, playing an instrument and you know they're not playing it at all. It's not them. They're just kind of doing whatever they want. So I, you know, I made sure that it was the correct finger and placement, whatever. So you did very well. Thank you. Appreciate it. Next. Hey, Gary. Hey, how's your car doing? <laughs> I made it home. You made it home. I don't yes. know if I'll make it home today. Okay. I did. And the show went well. Oh, good. We should uh, Very good. Like that. Very good. Two things, besides those things, two things I'm going to take away from, uh, from this convention in terms of meeting you. We expect the guests to generally be friendly and approachable, but uh, the Toronto connection and bringing your family in <laughs> and going around to making sure everybody gets photos, that's a classy move. And I want to thank you for oh, everything. Thank you. Very nice. Towards, um, I think it was the end of the third season, there were, <clears throat> I can lose my voice now, it's okay. Oh yes, go ahead. <laughs> Towards the end of the, uh, uh, the third season, just before uh, I believe Jerry Ryan came on, there were rumors that, uh, at least I heard rumors, that, uh, that you might be written out of the show and that there were difficulties getting you back, or that they didn't want you, or something like that, and I wanted to know if you can, now that it's all safe and done and all that, yes. I wanted to know if you can elaborate on that. Yes, um, that's true. There were definitely those rumors. That during that time, um, I'd have to say that I was a very... Oh, so they don't, they don't want to see that she doesn't thing. want me to say or talk about it at all. She's just like crying her butt off. Okay. Poor girl. <laughs> I feel bad now. <laughs> See what you did? No, um, being on the show as a young, early 20-something actor and uh, thrust into the limelight like that, you know, you tend to get a little full of yourself a little bit and uh, I think I, you know, I had my share of fun, with whatever, and I did at that time have some problems with punctuality, with tardiness at the time, and that's 
what inevitably led to a meeting where they were saying, you know, if you just keep doing this, you're, you're, we'll, you know, figure out a way to write you out of the show. I, I remember I called my mom about this, and she was like, ah, why? Why aren't you waking up in time? <laughs> Son, what are you doing? How can you do this? You ruined this opportunity. And I said, Mom, calm down. I'll take care of this, okay? Don't worry about this. I'll take care of this. And a lot of it also was I was getting kind of upset because I felt that I wasn't being featured as much as I could have. I mean, I felt that, and the, by nature of having nine people on a show, you can't, you only get two episodes per year that focuses around you. So it's very difficult to have a lot of uh, great episodes. So I, I, was, I was feeling that I was kind of going unused. So it was almost my way of lashing out, purposely being late at times. But my mom was so upset. I remember I said, look, it's, it's fine. She said, no, I, I can't take this. This was like on a Thursday I talked to her. I go to work Thursday. I'm on the set, and a security guard comes up. and like, uh, Garrett, somebody at the front gates of Paramount that says it's just your mom. And <laughs> High school. I'm not even. I'm not in junior high. I'm not in high school. I'm not even in college anymore. And my mom's at, at the school doors, right? So <laughs> she's at the front gate, and I'm thinking, oh my. I said, no. Hopefully it's an imposter. Hopefully it's an imposter. It's not really my mom. Some crazy, crazy Chinese woman, but not my mom. It's my mom. Okay. So it's my mom. She ends up going up into the office of Jerry Ryan, uh, Jerry uh, Taylor. Taylor, Jerry Taylor's office, uh, the one female executive producer, you know, and she's sitting there and she ends up, I find out later, you know, that she's been talking with Jerry Taylor saying, you know, you know please, my son is a good boy and this and that, and he really, he's, you know, he's got to give him another chance and, you know, and, and Jerry Taylor's like, I have a son, Alexander, he's also late, late to his, you know, calls he's a, as an actor also, I understand and all this. And so, you know, she had flown from, at the time she was living in San Francisco, she flew from San Francisco down to L.A. in this day to come and try to save my job, you know, which was just, I mean, that's really nice. That's a lot of concern. Thank you, Mrs. Wong. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Needless to say, you know, I mean, cleaned up my act, and I really, you know, stuck to the plan, and, and everything was fine after that. But yes, that I think we're, true. we're all very glad you, you kept the role, and if you ever need to visit family here, maybe you'll drop by. Right. Yeah. Maybe I will. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Can you tell us? Can you tell us a bit about the process and decisions of your getting into acting and moving to California and? just, you know, getting started in your career. Yeah, I, um, I, I moved to California, I was born in California, moved from California to Indiana, Indiana, Bermuda, Bermuda to Memphis, Tennessee, Tennessee, back to California for college at UCLA. I was pre-med to begin with, stopped being pre-med, changed from major to history, to econ, to poli-sci, to East Asian studies, and decided that I was gonna go into acting, which immediately my parents were very upset about. They were like, no, this can't be happening. You can't be an actor, are you crazy? Give us an example of a good actor uh, that's Asian American that's made it. I said, Bruce Lee, my mom said he's dead. So then I said, well, let me think about some other things. So she said, no, this is not good. We argued for five years. So she says, just make it a, keep it a hobby. Stay, go to med school like you're planning and keep it a hobby. I'm like, I'm going to be a surgeon in surgery. My pager will go off. I must go to an audition. That's not going to work. So she kept saying, no, keep it a hobby. Don't, don't act. It's not going to happen. Relatives from all over, not these ones, but other relatives were saying, this is no good. This is no good for you. So five years later, I finally say, look, I'm going to do it. I don't care what happens. I'm going to do this. So immediately from that, that point forward, a year and a half after that point that I said, I'm going to do it, I got Star Trek Voyager, you know, and that was just the most amazing thing to get. Like my parents were like, you know, happy. But the first job that I actually got was a Burger King commercial. I remember when I booked the Burger King commercial, I called my parents and I go, I finally, I booked a job, I booked a job, I, I got a commercial. It's, you know, my mom and dad are like, they're, they're skeptical. They're like, oh yeah? When are we gonna see it? I'm like, well, it takes a while to, to, to finish the production of the, of, the, of the commercial, and you're not gonna see it for a few months. They go, okay, yeah, whatever, whatever. So then uh, three months later, they're in Las Vegas, and I get a call at like 11.30 at night, and they never call at 11.30, and it's my dad, and he never calls me because it's always my mom who's a yap, 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 okay? I get everything from her. My dad's like quiet, quiet. My mom's like, blah, 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 blah. So my dad calls up. He's the quiet businessman guy. He's like, he's talking a mile a minute. He's like, son, son, we just saw it. I'm like, what? We saw your Burger King commercial. I'm like, huh? Oh, you look so good. You look and I play the employee. I'm wearing the hat and everything. You know, and my dad goes, you make a really good Burger King boy. I go, 
I'm like, wow, Burger King, I look like a very good Burger King boy. And I said, really? That's good. Oh, yeah, right. we're so happy. We're so, I'm so proud of you. And remember, my mom's the one who had been forever, you know, telling me, don't do this, don't do this. She actually called me up one day and said, you need some discipline. Don't forget about this acting thing. I suggest that you join the army. Okay, I mean, these are, this is a, a statement that she said to me. So my dad's like, oh, we're so proud of you. We're so happy. I said, I said oh, I really? You're happy? Is mom there? Yeah. And then dad's like, oh, yeah, she's there. She's there. She's here. Is she happy? Yeah, she's happy. Is she proud? Yeah, she is. Let me talk to her. Okay, hold on. He hands the phone over. It's dead silent. Okay. Like, Hello? Hello? Mom, are you there? Hello? Hello? And also, and there's silent because she, you know I, I showed her up basically because mom's always right, right? And this chance she's not right. So she goes, she answers. Finally, she answers. She's like, Yeah, I'm. It's hi. I'm here. Oh, oh, hi, mom. Okay, oh, Okay, are you proud? Yes, I'm proud. I mean, it was, it was so, the subtext was hilarious. You know, it was the most. Oh, they like, coming up that way. So it was the absolute, absolutely the most uh, best time of my life, the moment in my life when that happened. And they're coming. Are you leaving? Okay, I don't know what's going on, but they're they're walking out that way. Um, but the Burger King commercial thing. All right, bye. Okay. I don't um, so after Burger King, uh, I got Star Trek Voyager, and um, actually, All American Girl was another show that I booked right before Star Trek. I was on the set of All American Girl. Uh, hanging out in Clyde Kasatsu's trailer uh, when I called my agent, my agent answers, and he says, uh, uh, and he, my, my talent agent sounds like um, Stephen Wright, this really deadpan comedian, you know, so I'm talking, I'm talking to him, and he says, uh, I go, what happened? He's like, you got the job. I said, I got, I, I got the job? You booked Star Trek. I go, oh, I, are you messing with me? Why would I mess with you? <laughs> Because you don't sound like you're alive right now. I mean, you're not even excited. You were, show some excitement. I'm very excited. <laughs> so that was my agent when I found out about booking the job, so. Yes? Yeah, uh, No, he's not, actually. He's dead. No, just kidding. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, how was it, work, how is it being with, uh, working with George Takai? What is he like? Is he, is he soft one minute, hard the next? What? How's it working with him? Soft and hard one minute? <laughs> I wouldn't know that, sir. <laughs> I don't know. I, um, he's a great guy. I mean, he's a, he's a gentleman. And, and of course, with his classically trained... Any time you talk to somebody who speaks like this, you know, I mean, it's very... I don't know. He's just a great guy. I mean, I didn't work that much with him when I did that. All right, I'm going to go into a couple of stories before we get out of here. Um, um, the first one is uh, uh, the button-pushing thing. I don't know if you guys heard about this, but... I've noticed that if you watch Voyager, everyone has a different way of pushing buttons, okay, on the ship. I mean, you have all different types of styles, like, you know, if you look at Chicote, Chicote's sitting there, that little console thing pops up in the middle, <laughs> Chicote's kind of like, you know. <laughs> Robert Beltran, when he was younger, he was like the quarterback for high school, high school quarterback for football, and he was like a jock. So this is very similar to how a jock would, you know, kind of, you could see him grabbing some kid and giving him a noogie, you know, like that. <laughs> that same kind of a thing, okay? Now, you watch Tim Russ, Tuvok, when he pushes buttons kind of like this. <laughs> kind of like either a concert pianist, <laughs> Or he's playing basketball. <laughs> That's Tim Russ. Jerry Ryan, she pushes buttons. Seven of nine. <laughs> like she's getting a manicure. Captain Janeway, when she pushes buttons, it's like this. It's almost like she hasn't read the manual. Mr. Kim, status support. I, I don't know how this works. 
watching. I'm serious. She just she's always perplexed when she's pushing. She doesn't know what's happening. She's so she's the captain. She doesn't have to. She asked Kim to do it for her. That's all. Um, uh, Rob McNeil, <laughs> Tom Paris. Okay, Tom Paris, push your buttons. to say this. Do you like fries with that? <laughs> um, <laughs> right. uh, okay, one last story. This is the, this is, this is the, this is the creme de la creme. This is the piece de la resistance, resistance. Um, the story of, uh, the episode where, oh gosh. Tuvok goes through pond fog. Do you guys remember that scene? It's a dream sequence, right? Remember that? How the doctor is standing there. I think it was, was it Tinker Tenor Doctor Spy, maybe? It might have been that, where he was going through the dream sequence. The doctor actually saves the day by catching the, you know, by getting the, uh, 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 the, the sedative and, and putting Tuvok out. We're sitting there during some type of recital or something, right? So we're filming this, and it is very late in the day. And Tuvok, who is a huge practical joker, Tim Russ, had planned this joke to do, along with, you know, all the other guys working. And it got down to, this was the last scene of the day. It was probably about 1.30 in the morning. Everyone was tired. Tuvok was, uh, Tim was like, I said, are you guys gonna do it? Tim was like, I don't know, well, I don't know. I don't think we're gonna do it. I'm like, what? You gotta do it. I don't know, I mean, uh, McNeil thinks it's a bad idea. So I'm like, McNeil! I go, come on, Robbie, Robbie, what are you thinking? We gotta do this. He's like, I don't know, Garrett. I mean, everyone's tired, and I don't think it's a good idea. And I, I don't know, people are gonna get pissed off. We do it, it's 1 30, it's gonna take up time, and we do this joke. And that's, I don't know, it's not a good idea. We're gonna get in trouble. I'm like, oh, you wussy. I was so upset. I said, like, so I went over and I convinced Tuvok. I said, this is, you gotta do this. This is the time to do it because if you do this right now, everyone's gonna laugh so hard because everyone's so tired and dragging that this will energize, energize the crew and the cast and instead of ending at three in the morning, we'll finish at 2.15, okay? We should do this, do this, come on, troops, buckle up. So they did it. And uh, what we did was Tuvok sat there and he said to the cameraman, he goes, whatever you do, do not stop filming. Okay? So at that point, the cameraman was, like, he was half asleep. He's like, hmm, something's gonna happen. <laughs> so Tuvok is sitting there. He's going through pond far. He's like, you know, he's crying and he's shaking and he's you know, about to levitate, whatever. So he's freaking out. Pond far, pond far. And the camera's on him. And all of a sudden, Tuvok, Tim Russ gets up. He's like, pond far! Pond far! And he starts walking this way, and that's not the blocking, okay? So only the cameraman knows. Everyone else in the crew is like, what the? Ooh, what's going on? What the heck? What's he doing? Tuvok's like, bah, bah! He walks over, uh, the camera comes on me, and I'm like, ah, bah, bah! I run away this way. He runs over, grabs Neelix, and this is the mess hall, throws Neelix over a counter, and has his way with him right there. Which was the funniest thing. His reaction was, he's like, oh, oh, oh. he falls over, he's like, oh, oh. and then he looks up at the camera and smiles. <laughs> the whole, everyone fell to the floor. They were laughing so hard. You know when you laugh so hard, your stomach is like turned into knots, and you're like, stop it, stop it. Ah. Everyone was laughing so hard. We finished that scene in like 25, we're done. <clears throat> I mean, all the energy was there, and that piece of film is locked away. <laughs> it is in one of the producer's offices. If I can talk to somebody who's like in a SWAT team or something, and I can rappel into this office, I can be a very rich man. <laughs> very rich man. Forget about the Pamela Tommy Lee tape. This is a really good tape. <laughs> all right, um, Toronto, thank you very much for having me. Uh, I'm glad to be here. You've all been great. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Applaud for yourselves. Well, it's been a long time coming. I hope you uh, invite me back for more crazy stories. And uh, well, thank you. Standing ovation.